Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, I, before we start, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes to introduce our special lecturer today. Um, I just want to take the time to make a couple of announcements. One is that I need to harass all of you to do your ACGME uh, surveys. Yes? OK. Faculty and residents both need to do your ACGME uh, surveys. So you should have gotten emails. I'll send another. Uh, batch of, of emails from the ACGME to do that. So please uh, go ahead and do that. Secondly, we are accepting uh, volunteers or people who want to perform a singing number at uh, Grand Rounds on April 14th for World Voice Day. We are, have a few, um, a few volunteers already, and we'll, uh, if anybody else wants to do it, let me know, and we'll put you on the list. Um, and that takes us to just about time to start this, uh, the, the lecture today. So today our uh, lecturer is Grace Kim. She is uh, actually probably the longest tenured resi uh, resident here. Well, is here, but by the time you finish, I think, uh, how many years will you have been here at Stanford? Since Total. Oh, since 2010, so. So you and I came in the same year. <laughs> and, and you will, um, you will, I think, just pass Eduardo Corrales as the, as the longest, longest tenure, tenure here at Stanford, probably, for, for resident and fellow. Well, <laughs> yes, you will get a plaque. Okay. Or Excellent. something, something <laughs> similar. Uh, at least a certificate. Oh, perfect. Uh, so Grace, I think, has an interesting topic uh, that's uh, very uh, germane to Women's History Month this year, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, I really don't know what exactly you're talking about, so I will just leave it at that. Uh, but the title is The Sticky Surgical Floor, The Strive for Gender Equity in Otolaryngology. Here you go, Grace. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Yes, inspired by uh, Women's History Month, but also International Women's Day, which was last week. Um, so hello to those of you who I don't know, but I think everyone on the chat group I recognized. I'm going to make sure I can figure out all this audio and technical stuff. All right, it's not working. There we go. Okay, so no disclosures. Uh, how many of you have heard of the phrase, the sticky surgical floor? Anyone in the audience? So it is a phrase that some in the surgical field have started to use to illustrate the meta, uh, metaphoric glass ceiling in academic surgery. And despite significant strides that have been made, there are still groups of surgeons, including women, underrepresented minorities, LBGTQ, to name a few, who continue to face disproportionate challenges and biases, hindering access to opportunities and professional development. And so this, that is a very big topic, and I'm going to take a slice of it to focus on tonight, um, talking about women in medicine and surgery to highlight kind of where we are today, why it matters, and how we can make it better. All right. Many of you probably saw this cover of the New Yorker's Health, Medicine, and the Body Issue of April 3rd, 2017. The piece was titled The Operating Theater, and it was a uh, done by French artist Malika Favre, and four female members of a surgical team are gazing down over a patient in the operating room, and the artist explained that her original goal was to uh, present a piece capturing the feeling of a person lying and um, having people watch you lose consciousness in the operating room. But soon after the piece was released, Dr. Susan Pitt, an endocrine surgeon at the University of Wisconsin, issued a challenge to female surgeons to recreate the illustration in real life to bring visibility to women and other minority groups working in, tr in a traditionally white, male-dominated field. And hundreds of women across the world responded, taking photographs and sharing them online with the hashtag, I look like a surgeon. And it was really a moment of empowerment and bonding and the message amongst the female surgeons was very clear. I see you and to the world to see us. So women seem to have always been healers. So this includes women in their traditional domestic roles and women as lay practitioners, but they were not typically recognized as professionals. However, this role started to change in the mid-19th century with one major milestone, the admittance of doc, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell 
to medical school. She wasn't a doctor yet. Um, she attended Geneva College in New York, and her acceptance to medical school is actually a practical joke of her male um, colleagues. Uh, but she persevered, and she became the first woman to receive a medical degree in the U.S. in 1949. She graduated top of her class. And it's actually interesting to think that she graduated with a medical degree even before she had the right to vote in this country. Um, as the first medical colleges for women began to open their doors in the 1850s, such as the Women's College of Pennsylvania, shown here in the far right, some welcomed the move while others shunned it. An editorial in the Boston Journal at the time quoted, we consider the needle a much more appropriate weapon in the hands of women than the scalpel. So mixed reviews. In the 1900s, the American Medical Association made it a priority to reform medical schools, standardize and set minimum requirements for medical education, which ultimately resulted in higher tuition, longer training periods, and this created additional barriers for immigrants, lower and working class uh, Americans, as well as women to access medical education, and it cre ultimately created a more socially homogenous profession. And as a result, only 6% of U.S. physicians in 1910 were female, and it would remain that way for 50 years. In otolaryngology specifically, there are several notable women who were the true pioneers in the specialty. In the early 20th century, doctors Margaret Butler and Emily Van Loon of the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania acted as two of the earliest female leaders in our field. They held consecutive positions as the head of the Department of Otolaryngology at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, and there they really flourished, um, were inventors of different surgical uh, instruments, um, and really set the, the groundwork for future female otolaryngologists. In 1963, only 0.5% of otolaryngologists in the U.S. were women. And by 1980, the number had only risen to 1.5%. It wasn't until 2010, so it's a pretty big gap of 30 years, that the women in otolaryngology section of the academy was founded by three female otolaryngologists to provide the academy a dynamic professional community of women and men to seek gender equality in the specialty. And despite that, even as recent as 2014, there were still only 14.5% women in the field. The latest report from the AAMC in 2018 showed that 32% of otolaryngologists now are women. So that's a huge increase in that interval of time. But how does that compare in the grand scheme of women in medicine? So every few years, the AAMC releases a report on the state of women in academic medicine, and it's based on extensive survey data, GME reports, and faculty rosters. And the most recent report was just published in September 2020 from data collected from 2018 to 2019. And it showed that women represent just over 50% of medical school applicants and matriculates, yet only 48% of medical school graduates are women, and only 46% of U.S. medical graduates, uh, medical residents are women. About 41% of faculty are female, although the majority of uh, female faculty are at the instructor level, about 58%. And the number only gets smaller as we survey leadership positions, with only 29% of division chiefs, 25% of full professors, 18% of department chairs, and 18% of deans being women. So, and, uh, and of note, the majority of those holding department leadership positions were white, with only 5 to 8 percent of all the female department chairs being African American or Hispanic. So if we look specifically at trainees, we can see that all of the surgical fields, excluding obstetrics and gynecology, are in this bottom group of specialties, um, with less than 50 percent of female trainees. And looking specifically, uh, specifically at otolaryngology, the data shows that about 36% of trainees are women, and so that lags behind the national average of 46% female residents across all specialties. Here we look at the transition from residency to board certification. The solid light green line uh, represents the ratio of female to male residents. And you can see there's a gradual increase in the number of female residents since data has been collected in 2007 as the ratio gets closer and closer to one. Um, however, seen in the dashed light green line, kind of lower on the screen, 
the number of board certified female otolaryngologists staggers behind. And that's likely reflecting the impact of a historically male dominated field. Nonetheless, the number of board certified uh, female otolaryngologists remains low. And even accounting for their underrepresentation in otolaryngology, women comprise a smaller proportion of academic senior faculty. And so you can see here a breakdown where the majority of faculty in clinical instructor positions are women, while fewer and fewer women hold assistant, associate, and full professorships. When we look at department leadership positions, only 27% of residency directors, 15% of fellowship directors, and a small 5% of department chairs are women. So why are there so few women in top leadership? 17% of women in otolaryngology reported in a survey that they felt their gender was the reason that uh, prevented their career to advance. Um, when cohorts of women in medicine graduating in 1980, 1990, and 2000 were examined in 2014, women were less likely to be professors by 2014 than their male counterparts. Um, there were more women who were assistant and associate professors compared to their male counterparts in, in all of these cohorts. So what hinders gender equity in surgery and specifically otolaryngology? There are multitude of factors, both known and unknown, that have led to the disparity between women and men in surgery. And I'm going to go, spend a little bit of time going over some of the recent data examining some of these barriers. So there are many factors that contribute towards an individual's promotion. And one of the most important factors discussed is uh, scholarly productivity. The ability to show consistent and impactful uh, work is critical to academic success. And in this 2019 paper in Laryngoscope, the authors utilized the H index, which is a numerical value defined as the number of articles H with citation number greater than or equal to H. It's a number calculated that will often be used as a surrogate for research output and scholarly productivity. And so a relatively higher H index value is associated with increased productivity, academic rank, and promotion. So the figure here shows the years in practice um, on the x-axis in relation to H index by gender and academic rank on the y-axis. So academic rank increases as the H index and the years of practice increase, which makes sense. Uh, but very few women are, uh, hold directorship roles after 20 years, and that's shown here in the right-hand side of the far right uh, with the plus sign. And few have H indices that are greater than 30. This could possibly, again, reflect the low number of women in the surgical pipeline, given that even as recent as 2014, we only had 14.5% of otolaryngologists uh, that were practicing were women. Thus, women may just not have had enough time to achieve full professor rank or take on prominent leadership roles. Despite these challenges, there's hope in the data that suggests that women in otolaryngology are taking on residency and fellowship directorships with fewer years in practice than their male counterparts. And it's shown in this figure, the H index of residency and fellowship directors by academic rank and gender. And as expected, the H index increases with rank as you move from left to right. And in a subgroup analysis, women, shown in the light uh, bar graph, had significantly lower H indices than their male counterparts for their respective rank, with differences most stark at the rank of full professorship. And so this could be suggestive of a trend of early involvement in positions of leadership um, among women and how this data in 15 years may look very different as female representation increases in academic otolaryngology. There are probably, you know, certain there are certain aspects of the research environment, however, that is limiting the ability of women to advance. Um, the study in 2013 showed that there was a stark contrast in the amount of NIH funding received by male versus female primary investigators. Uh, men had significantly higher funding levels at both the level of an assistant professor as well as 10, 20 years into their career. Men also had a higher percentage of prestigious R-series grants from the NIH. Despite that, that same group showed that women are able to catch up and even exceed their male colleagues. So while women produce less research earlier in their careers, as shown by the gray line 
uh, relative to the black line towards the left portion of the graph. Um, as they become more senior, uh, moving uh, towards the right, they either equal or exceed the research productivity of their male colleagues. Um, some of the barriers, though, that the group just, uh, identified to this disparity are a lack of mentorship and unequal family responsibilities. So that elusive work-life balance, which I know everybody loves talking about. How much does that really impact the ability of women to pursue a surgical career as well as strive in them? A 2011 survey by the Academy um, conducted uh, amongst trainees found that a little over 55% of both gender listed family consideration as an important factor in determining choice of practice. So that indicated that this is an important issue for both genders. Despite that, a 2004 study found that the number of children significantly affects the professional work hours for women but not men in non-academic practices, so shown on the right-hand side of that graph. Interestingly, it did not seem to impact women in academic practices as much, although, again, the study is a little dated, um, and that might potentially be due to the infrastructure of an academic practice being a little different with more colleagues and, and academic non-clinical time built in. Um, nonetheless, the same study reported that male otolaryngologists were more likely to rely on their spouse or partner for childcare and household responsibilities than female otolaryngologists, which adds another physical and mental burden on female surgeons, which can be quite impactful, especially as young surgeons are beginning their careers. And recently, many of you may have seen the work of Dr. Erica Rangel um, from Brigham and Women's in the media, in the New York Times, the uh, Washington Post, and her work has looked at how pregnancy and motherhood affects surgical trainees and faculty attrition, clinical success, and academic promotion, and it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, her 2018 study, which was published in JAMA Surgery, was a survey-based study looking at how many female surgical trainees agreed or disagreed with various topics uh, related to pregnancy and motherhood. And I just wanted to highlight a few things because there's a lot on here. Highly recommend the paper if you're interested. But a majority of women agreed that they were worried about how they would be perceived potentially negatively by attendings and co-residents if they asked for or needed a lighter schedule during pregnancy. They took shorter uh, maternity leave than they would have liked for various reasons, but mostly due to very strict board policies. Um, most felt that the length of their maternity leave, uh, leave was not sufficient, and many worried that others would think that they were behind their peers in terms of surgical skills because being a mom meant you had less time to dedicate to your work. And although the vast majority felt like breastfeeding or pumping was important to them, many had to stop earlier than they would have liked due to a lack of access to lactation areas uh, or a perceived lack of support or discomfort with asking to leave a case to pump. And overall, over 50% of women felt that their experience of pregnancy and motherhood during surgical residency made them strongly reconsider whether they wanted to stay in surgery or not, although most of them chose not to, uh, would not choose another career that would potentially be more accommodating. In a more recent study by the same group, they looked at pregnancy complication rates among female surgeons, and they found that 42% of female surgeons had a pregnancy loss, more than twice the rate of the general population. Female surgeons have fewer children than male surgeons. Almost 25% of female surgeons, compared to 70% of men, had used uh, re assisted reproductive technology. 48% experienced a major pregnancy complication, and 11% experienced postpartum depression. This study ultimately highlighted not only the fact that female surgeons are often waiting until they are older to start a family, but how the demands of work itself, long hours of standing in the operating room, dehydration, et cetera, is impacting their health during and after pregnancy. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about the policies here at Stanford for many of you who may not be familiar with them um, for trainees as someone who has experienced it firsthand very recently. Um, there is no universal parental leave policy at Stanford, but rather it depends on the department and their respective licensing board. And the number of weeks vary pretty dramatically from um, anywhere from six weeks of paid leave for most surgical subspecialties, up to over three months for some of the non-surgical subspecialties in our um, institution without having to make up time. Child care options are available, but often limited and expensive, and there are long wait lists with trainees toward the bottom of the priority list. 
Federal law requires employees to provide a reasonable amount of time and room other than a bathroom in close proximity to your work to pump or nurse. Um, and there are a limited number of rooms on the Stanford campus that are often not located in a convenient location for surgeons who are often in a rush. <laughs> The GME has recently added fertility benefits for its trainees in an effort to recognize that trainees are waiting longer and longer to start having families. And something that I've been a part of for the past few years uh, is the GME Women in Medicine uh, Leadership Council. And it's a wonderful group of female trainees and faculty at Stanford who meet to discuss important issues facing female trainees and, and faculty, but also to initiate change in policy affecting women at Stanford. Um, and now, just a quick break so you don't have to hear me talking the entire time. I'm going to play a little video for you. Um, this was an ad played during the Super Bowl. Of course, it's probably not going to play. Hmm. Let me see if I can. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. You mean like, well, I have a, maybe I just do this. So this is a ad from the 2017 um, Super Bowl. I'll share it in a second. <laughs> I tell her that her grandpa's worth more than her grandma? That her dad is worth more than her mom? Do I tell her that despite her education, her drive, her skills, her intelligence, she will automatically be valued as less than every man she ever meets? something different. So, um, gender disparity is a hot topic even in the world of business and despite its important message of driving progress and equal pay for women and men, it made headlines for all of the wrong reasons. Um, oh, no, I think it's probably slow. We, we can't hear you, Grace. I'm sorry. Um, are you able to hear me now? Perfect. Okay, great. So I was mentioning that despite its important message of driving progress and equal pay, it made headlines for all of the wrong reasons. In reality, Audi has no female on their six-person executive team, and only 6% of their board of directors is women. And the company signed the White House Equal Pay, uh, pay Pledge, which was uh, created in 2016, but it's unclear if they've actually made any adjustments to the company policy to um, actually result in equal pay. Oh, it's playing on my computer. Let me see how, there we go. However, the issue of gender pay gap is a big one, not only in the business world, but in medicine as well. The gender pay gap is defined as a difference between the amount of money paid to women and men performing the same or similar job with similar levels of experience. And the Institute of Women's Policy Research estimates that the national pay equity will not be reached until 2059. And as shown here, the gender pay gap in the U.S. has remained relatively stable in recent years, shown on the left-hand side. Um, and that's shown as a percentage of men's median hourly earning that women are making. So it's stayed roughly in the 80 percentile range. 
Um, but if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, which looks only at the young workers ages 25 to 34, the gap is narrowing, uh, suggesting an improvement that hopefully will translate into a, a more global change over time. Based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics Occupational Employment Statistics data from May 2018, physicians and surgeons have the largest gender pay gap uh, out of a list of 123 different occupations. And according to the Washington Post, physicians, female physicians and surgeons start working for free on September 5th of the calendar year based on the salary women make compared to men. In 2019, the AAMC took two important steps towards salary equity. They published the Promising Practices, which reported salary gaps for multiple medical and surgical fields. Of all of them, otolaryngology had the second largest gender pay gap, with women earning 77 cents for every dollar um, earned by a male colleague. In addition, they reported the annual median salary by region, professor rank, and by gender. And as shown here, there is a gender pay gap at every professor rank. Um, and over the course of 30 years, this calculates out to over $3 million in difference in salary. And now the last topic uh, in terms of barriers that I'd like to discuss is discrimination and microaggressions faced by women in medicine. Uh, so these forms of discrimination can be verbal, nonverbal, obvious, subtle, intentional, non-intentional. Um, it can include things like sexual harassment, gender inferiority, and implicit bias or sexist stereotypes, such as women are bossy, aggressive, passive. A survey of women in otolaryngology members in 2018 showed that almost 50% of female otolaryngologists in all age groups and geographic regions shown in the top half of the graph here, have experienced either subtle or significant harassment. The most common type of harassment was verbal, but it comes from a broad range of people, including leaders within their department, colleagues, patients, staff. The concept of unconscious bias is a big one, but an important one when it comes to discrimination and microaggressions. Implicit gender career biases are unintentionally learned biases due to historically or socioculturally embedded stereotypical gender role expectations. For instance, men are considered to be career-oriented, ambitious, competitive, while women are considered to be family-oriented, nurturing, communal, and warm. Um, the general presumption in the field is that gender biases is strongest among male doctors in male-dominated surgical specialties. However, a recent study in, um, published in BMC Medical Education showed that actually women may have stronger implicit biases from deep-rooted stereotypes or negative experiences of discrimination. So, for instance, self-promotion may be interpreted as aggression or bossiness. Or on the flip side, women can be interpreted as being meek and passive in a more competitive environment. So many of you may already know about this uh, high-profile example of unconscious bias in the field of surgery. A group of vascular surgeons um, published a paper in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2020 with the intent of showing how publicly available social media content may affect how patients choose their physician. Um, they used social media of young vascular surgeons that were publicly available via Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and they determined unprofessional content such as pictures of intoxication, attire, offensive comments, etc. Specifically, they had judged public social media posts of female surgeons um, as provocative posing in uh, bikinis or swimwear on off hours as potentially unprofessional. This quickly came under, the fi under fire for the authors not identifying conscious and unconscious biases in their methodology. Uh, as a result, the paper was not only retracted, uh, the authors issued an apology, but it also launched the med bikini hashtag. Um, it was a hashtag used by women and men physicians posting pictures of themselves in swimwear to address sexism and the targeting of women. And another critical component for a surgeon's success is patient reviews and feedback. But herein lies the problem of patient unconscious biases. A recent study looked at patient reviews of general and subspecialty surgeons in the US urban areas um, on widely available websites, such as RateMDs.com and Yelp, 
And women surgeons were more likely to have positive reviews on social interactions, bedside manner, as compared to men, whereas man, male surgeons were more likely to have positive ratings on technical skills, surgical skills, ability to um, treat, so compared to women. So I've touched upon just a fraction of the barriers that could potentially hinder achieving gender equity, and there are more known and unknown factors that I can't cover all today. But why? Why does any of this matter? So there are a number of reasons, but one that I wanted to highlight today was the gender impact on clinical outcomes. This study in 2014 in primary care showed that gender discordance between patient and provider was associated with worse rapport, lower certainty of diagnosis, concerns of a hidden agenda by the patient, and disagreements about the advice provided. And these negative effects on interpersonal and interactions can adversely impact the ability for the provider to pr uh, provide care, um, especially in the arena of preventative care protocols and clinical outcomes. These findings can be seen with surgical outcomes. In this population-based retrospective cohort study that was published just earlier this year in January, adult patients who underwent common elective or emergent surgery in Ontario, Canada between a, or a certain period of time were analyzed, and gender discordance between surgeon and patient, mostly for female patients with male surgeons, were associated with a small but statistically significant increased likelihood of adverse post-operative outcomes. Of course, the New York Times picked this up and blew it up as women have a 32% increased risk of dying if they are operated on by a male surgeon. So not quite the impact that we wanted, but um, it does show that better outcomes are seen for women on the right-hand side when they are um, treated by a female surgeon. The data is a little equivocal for men, which is, I think, interesting. Um, they also examine adjusted absolute rates of each of the outcomes across surgeon, patient, gender, concordance, and discordance, and they stratified it by surgical subspecialty. And so while male patients consi consistently had higher rates of post-operative adverse events, um, there were relatively small differences in the rate of these adverse outcomes, whether they were treated by a male or a female. So that's kind of seen in um, this line here whether they um, were seen by a, a male uh, or a female. Um, but more consistently, what we see is that female patients treated by male surgeons had consistently higher adjusted rates of post-operative uh, events. Um, and this difference is slightly more subtle in otolaryngology, because um, you can see I just picked another um, specialty, like uh, cardiothoracic surgery, that had a more prominent difference between male and female. So that was just, again, one example for the sake of time, but I wanted to move on to how do we strive for equity? How do we make things better? And the approach to combat gender inequality will likely be multi-layered, and it will require intervention at the individual, organizational, national, and global levels. Um, so things like creating the women in otolaryngology groups at different institutions and um, licensing boards, signing of the White House Equal Pay Pledge, recognition of International Women's Day around the world. And while these are not direct solutions, they bring attention to the issue and they keep it in the forefront of a generation who's kind of fed up with the status quo. And so I wanted to end my talk kind of highlighting one aspect of intervention at the individual level that we as a department have started to do and can continue to grow, and that's mentorship. So mentorship fosters development through a longitudinal relationship with an individual who provides advice, feedback, coaching, and this can have a significant impact on, on a person's development and their academic career path and their ability to produce impactful research. And while not absolute, there is data to suggest that same-sex mentorship and role models actually have a po significantly positive effect on trainees and faculty. Um, however, a landmark 1998 uh, survey found that women are less likely than male colleagues to identify same-sex mentors, and multiple studies have identified the paucity of female role models to be a barrier to recruiting and retaining women in academia, and this may be a byproduct, again, of the historical gender gap, catching up, uh, resulting in fewer women in senior roles or leadership positions who are able to serve as role models and mentors. 
And there is also an increasing awareness that mem mentorship is, may not be enough for career advancement, particularly for women and underrepresented minorities. The concept of sponsorship is gaining recognition in academic medicine due to its popularity in the business arena. So sponsorship is defined as active support by someone appropriately placed in the organization regardless of gender who has significant influence on decision making processes or structures and who can advocate for protecting and fighting for the career advancement of an individual. In academic medicine, junior women faculty are more likely than their male colleagues to value gender concordance in mentoring relationships, and they may fail to recognize the need for support from more senior faculty and from leaders and mentors outside of their own department or even their institution. Um, in the world of business, sponsorship also serves as a way to address the double bind faced by women, and this term refers to women who try to promote themselves being penalized or for appearing too ambitious or too self-promoting. So how does our department fare compared to national averages? We have 32% of our faculty and 31% of our trainees who are women, which is comparable to national averages. In this group, we have three women full professors, two fellowship directors, and one department chair. There are a number of NIH research grants, and we are very privileged to be on an institution that um, advocates for gender equity, equality. Uh, Stanford actually has a global center for gender equality um, that has a vision for a world where gender equality is just a basic human right, making talks like mine obsolete. So I wanted to end by saying that as a daughter and a wife and a mother of two young children, I am here today because of the efforts of many who came before me to make this possible, but it's not foolproof. It's not 100% guaranteed. We still lose female trainees and surgeons along the way. So I hope that everyone who was here today, like myself, has been inspired to seek out and combat the inequities and disparities in our field that we see. And a time will come when talks like mine will look very different. And children like those two on the screen will be treated as equals in all aspects, at school, at work, at home, aside from just matching PJs. <laughs> Thank you. Should I stop sharing? Or how yeah, we'll just start sharing. OK. I'll open that up. Oh, I didn't know that. Dr. Trong shared that, um, I, th I guess Dr. Erica Rangel did her residency here. Um, I was curious, I, if there isn't a question, just to kind of pose to the audience, in preparing for this talk, I initially, as I'm sure you saw the email go out, I titled it Gender Inequality, uh, and starting for Gender Equality. And um, after doing a lot more reading and research, I actually changed it to Gender Equity, not really knowing that there was actually a very strong difference between the two um, in the field of gender disparities work. Um, equality being, you know, you give everyone the same tools, but that elevates everyone a little differently, and, and gender equity, trying to raise everybody to the same level. And I'm just curious if anyone has any thoughts about what's the right approach? How do we, how do we tackle this behemoth of a, a problem? Oh, sorry, I can get rid of that. That <laughs> seems a little distracting. Dr. Trung said, should we consider sexual harassment in medicine more about power than sex? Yeah, it's, it is a power dynamic that I think um, plays into a lot of this and, and sort of those stereotyped gender roles of, uh, that again play into to those, uh, the implicit biases that sometimes impact us in ways that I think sometimes we don't even realize is happening. 
Great. I want to um, kind of congratulate you for, for doing this talk, first of all, and then also recognize you as being such a trailblazer in our uh, department. Uh, first of all, being our first uh, CSPP resident, uh, and then and volunteering to do that, you know, uh, when you weren't matched to that, that spot. So that's a tremendous. Uh, uh, Grace, can you repeat the comment because we can't hear uh, Kwong. Sorry about that. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of try to repeat myself. I, I said I, I wanted to congratulate Grace on, on this excellent talk, uh, but also recognize her as a trailblazer in our department, uh, being the uh, first CSTP resident in our, in our department um, uh, and volunteering for it when she you know, wasn't matched to that track originally. So uh, I think it's a uh, you know, great sign of, of her dedication to uh, to our field and and uh, an academic path, and uh, obviously she's uh, you, you've done you know tremendous research in your time uh, as that CSTP resident and made us uh, tremendously proud. Um, and secondly, as a trailblazer, as the first resident I've, in my time here to have had children during during residency, both I I during your research years, but even more impressively during your chief year. Uh, and um, I guess I mean I, I don't know how much personal detail you want you want to you want to share, but how, I mean how do you how do you think uh, well I guess they were very different, right? One during I during research time, full time research time, and then one during uh, you know active clinical time. How were they different for you and? Obviously, one was easier than the other. Um, is there anything, what could we have done as a department and medical school to make, or, you know, uh, to make it the second one closer to the first one in, in terms of ease? Thank you, Dr. Sun. I feel like that was really, uh, it was very nice of you <laughs> to say. Um, yeah, I mean, they. I feel like both had their difficulties for different reasons. Becoming a parent for the first time, I think, regardless of when you do it, is challenging. Um, I do think it was fortunate that I had the foresight to try to plan that during a time when I wasn't bound to a schedule that I had very little control over. That allowed me to be a little more flexible. Um, and I think that was probably the only reason why I even entertain the idea of having children as a, res as a clinical resident. Um, I think the experience that I had being just a little more seasoned made it possible. And I think if I had not done that, I don't know that I would have had the confidence that of being able to do it, especially in my chief year, to have a baby for the first time. I, you know, I think both instances, the, well, I guess the first time the department didn't find out till I brought the baby to Grand Rounds <laughs> that I had had a baby. I was a little secretive, and I and in hindsight, actually, it's really interesting in the process of making this talk. In hindsight, I remember sort of actively avoiding sharing the news with people. I was worried about the same things that I talked about. You know, I was worried that people would see me as, oh, she's going to go the mommy track. You know, she's going to, she's not going to work as hard. She won't be able to work as hard, or you know, and it, it really concerned me. And so I really kept it a secret for a very, very long time. And I kind of had the complete opposite approach my second time. And, and, and I think it, it does come with a little bit of experience and um, the support the department did give me. I think everyone has been so supportive with my pregnancy and, and post-pregnancy that I'm trying to think, you know, what could have been done to make it easier. You know, I never felt uncomfortable asking to, I need to take a break because I was 34 weeks pregnant and my blood pressure was shooting through the roof. I don't feel any hesitation in asking in the ORs that I need to leave to go pump. I feel like I've gotten so much support. Um, it's just kind of, uh, yeah. And so some of the things that I've talked about, I feel like in our department is unique in that I haven't felt those. But I do wonder if I hadn't had that first experience, if I would have the confidence to just ask for those things and feel comfortable with those things. And so 
that is a long-winded answer to, I'm not sure how to make the second one easier. I, I think it's just normalizing it to where there are more people doing it. I think there just has to be, I think the department can be as supportive as, you know, they can be, but if you don't see other residents who are doing it, it's just hard to believe that it's possible. So I think just more of us passing the word on, and, and I think it's great. We have more residents having kids. <laughs> and, and being realistic that it is it's challenging. challenging. Yeah. And like saying that it's not is it would not be true, but yeah. but saying it's totally doable yeah. and that and that it is a completely realistic option and people will support you and help you through it. Um, yeah, I completely agree with it. Yeah. But having people around you doing it makes it a much more realistic yeah, and it, and it goes to not just trainees, but faculty. You know, we have lots of faculty who have had children recently, and I think that was a huge component of, of relief coming back as a clinical resident, um, having faculty who had just experienced it, who understood what it meant to, you know, need a break, or, um, and, and kind of not even asking if I needed it, but just saying, hey, you're going to go now, take care of your things. And so that kind of understanding that flows through every level of the department, I think, is really critical. But yeah, just being realistic. Um, I think uh, <laughs> it's also really interesting, while researching this talk, a lot of the sort of older talks about gender equality is about how women can have it all, and, and, it, and, and the trend has really changed to, there, it's probably not true. Like, you probably can't have it all. There will be days when you won't be able to make it home to see your kids before they go to bed. Um, you're research work may sit a week or two longer than you would have liked and so um, but being realistic again like Chloe was mentioning about those expectations and letting residents especially as trainees know that that's not a sign of weakness I think is really important because that was my biggest fear with my first pregnancy is that I was going to be seen as someone who was taking sort of a, an easy route through residency now that I was a mom. <laughs> Grace, I wanted to make a comment. Um, so many similarities with your experience and my experience. I had three children all during training as well. Well, you had two. But um, I had my first one during T32, same rationale. So I'm, I'm just so happy to hear you speaking about this topic and speaking so openly. And we're all just so proud of what you've accomplished. Thank you. That's Thank you. Yeah, I, I think normalizing our experiences and making it as, you know, as relatable is really important for future trainees. And just the fact that we can have this grand rounds and speak openly about these topics uh, really shows progress. I don't think this would have happened where I trained. And I did the same thing as you. Uh, and I think back to my logic of why have a secret pregnancy? Why schedule all your rotations at the VA or away and only come back to to your home rotation when you're about to birth a baby and surprise everybody. I, I don't, I can't explain it, but I think it's very important that we start talking about these things so that in the future, other women don't feel that they have to do that. Yeah, it was actually really interesting because as many of you know, my husband is also, I think he's still on the Zoom call, is also a, a trainee. He is now a fellow, but at the time of my first pregnancy was a resident in the urology department at UCSF. And the minute we found out that we were expecting. He told everybody in the department. Everyone knew. Um, and so, <laughs> and, and on the sort of the contrast, I scheduled my ultrasound appointments at the end of the day when I knew that none of our faculty would be walking through F3. I just, I, and I hid in one of the bathrooms until my appointment time so no one would see me. It was just an odd thing uh, how starkly different our reaction to the pregnancy was. And it, it almost seems silly now that I think back on it. But you know, it, is, it is interesting to think about the psychology of what goes on. Um, when Very different psychology. Um, <laughs> other differences I noticed, my, my husband was also a fellow. And there was one day where my child was sick and we couldn't find, you know, even a random stranger to watch our kid. Uh, and I told my husband, well, you're going to be the one that doesn't go to work. It's not going to be me because, you know, I mean, it's not equal. You have to understand that. And of course, when he called in sick from work, you know, everyone's like, oh, his kid is sick. His kid's sick. Yeah, yeah. It's all going to be fine. <laughs> I don't know if this has changed. Um, I don't know why our minds are wired to think this way. Um, 
I've noticed myself also uh, behaving differently than my spouse on even Zoom calls. Um, for example, if I'm having, if I'm in the Zoom division meeting or any other meeting, and my kids are somehow going to come into the screen, I am like very serious about no kids on the screen. And my husband asked me, why are you trying to hide your kids? Like, what, are you embarrassed? Is it something bad? What is the culture in, in this subspecialty? Whereas in other subspecialties, it's like there's kids on the screen all the time. You have a life. It's accepted. So it's just all these things that this brings up and, and, and really makes me consider. It doesn't really change how professional you are. It doesn't change how hard you work. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, with, with information like what you've presented today, that's very eye-opening. Uh, and conversations that are very frank like this, we can move forward as a group. Absolutely. I, I do think it's, it's interesting how much of it is so just unconscious that we're doing it. Um, and the, it's almost like when, we, when genders behave contrasting to what their gender stereotype is, they're applauded. If you're a man, <laughs> that kind of goes against, uh, goes along with, you know, your husband who w had to take time off to take care of the kids. Like, oh, my gosh, that's wonderful. That's great. Because, you know, the stereotype is that men aren't the nurturing, family-oriented. And if you break that gender stereotype, now you're breaking the mold and fight and, you know, striving towards gender equality. And, and then in reality, it kind of almost goes, swings the pendulum too far the other way. So it's a it's an interesting problem that, yeah, it's it's hard. It's it, and I understand why we still have the problem because it's a hard one to fix. Hi, Grace. Um, I also wanted to comment that um, the hiding in the bathroom and having the secret pregnancy is not specific to trainees. It happened to me also, um, and I had you know my first experience when I was a faculty member, and um, I just dreaded anyone finding out. Right, and I think that. And you touched on this some, it's, it's also reframing our personal identity because it is a very uncharted.